God says, you are strong when you feel weak. You are loved when you feel like you're not enough. Can we thank Katie one more time? Thank you, Katie, so much. So speaking of feeling strong, maybe you, like me, had strong women in your life growing up, godly women who shaped who you became. One of those women, yes, my mother was one, but there was another woman I called mother early on when I was young. Uh, when, when my family first moved to Liberia, West Africa, when I was six years old, most of you have heard me mention this, uh, we moved to the world's thickest rainforest on, on a small mission station. And when we first got there, when I was six, there was the founder, the woman who founded the mission station. She was still living there. She was in her 90s. And everyone on the mission, including me, we called her Mother George. In fact, I have a picture of her here. That's her up on the left. And uh, Mother George, and we're standing in front of the bamboo mat house I grew up in. And that's me and my twin brother on the right. With, and he's the one with a really bad haircut, if you're wondering which is the one. <laughs> They're both bad haircuts. They're like horrible. Anyway, so... So Mother George, she, when we had gotten there, she had been there for decades. Uh, Mother George's story is, is she's an African-American woman from Waco, Texas. And when she graduated from college in the early 20th century, uh, she, in, in two, I'm sorry, in 1914, she went to her Baptist mission board and she said, I feel like God is calling me to be a missionary in Africa. And they said, well, you can't go. You're single. You need to get married first. And she told them, I don't have time for that. You know, uh, who, you know I, I can't do that right now. I need, God wants me to go now. That's too much trouble right now. And, and they said, well, you, we can't send you. So she founded her own mission board. And Mother George sent herself to Africa. And she got on a cargo ship, on a steam cargo ship, and made her way to Liberia. And then she moved to, to the world's thickest rainforest and founded this mission station among the Sapo tribe where I grew up. And when she got there, no one had heard about Jesus Christ. She was the first one. And she founded this mission station for girls initially, just to bring in girls from the villages to rescue them from becoming child brides. When we got there, she'd had more than a thousand girls come through her school. And every night as the sun was setting and the African tropics would cool down, that the students would bring a rattan chair out to the middle of the grass air landing field. And she would sit in that chair and she would tell us stories. And she would tell us Bible stories and she would teach Bible stories, but then she would tell us stories about her own life. And she told us stories about her mother and how her mother had to stand on the auction blocks in Mississippi as a slave. She told us those stories. She told stories of how in 1940, when she was living in this jungle mission station, she had run out of money because every few months she was supposed to get a check from America for $200, but that check hadn't come for months. And then she went to the, the post office. There was, you could walk like a day's walk to Greenville and get your mail. And they told her, the check you're expecting, we think it's in Monrovia. It had gone to the capital city. That was 200 miles away. So with two students, she walked 200 miles. They said they took a wheelbarrow. One of the men I knew well uh, when he was older, his name Otto Klebo, Mr. Klebo. Mr. Klebo said, she got tired, so I pushed her in the wheelbarrow, most of the 200 miles, to the post office. It took him over two weeks. She gets there, and the postal workers, when she asked for her mail, they said, Mother, Mother George, we thought you had died. It's been so long since you came. We sent your mail back to America. And so she didn't have even the $200. But that was her story. And, and Mother George, while she was there, she planted 27 churches. The young Liberian standing next to her is Reverend Augustus Marwia, later Bishop Marwia. He turned that into over 200 churches. Her churches became the largest denomination in the country. All from one godly woman who wouldn't t t take no for an answer. I, today on this Mother's Day... I want to look at what the Bible shows us through Paul's missionary journey and how, and how God uses Paul to empower women. As I started to read about, so if you're just joining us, we're going through the missionary journeys of Paul. And today we come to his second missionary journey. And as I started to read about this second missionary journey, it hit me that in practically every city that he stops in and, we, and Luke writes about, 
He writes that Paul is recruiting women to join his team, to plant churches. And Paul is empowering these women. So I'm titling our our message today, Paul's Empower Women Tour. How do you like that? And so on this Mother's Day, I want to, as we look at Paul's missionary journey, I want to remind us of the Bible's call to lift up and empower women. And so we'll start with Lydia. Uh, Paul leaves Athens and he travels, this is Athens in Syria, and he travels north to the coastal town. It's northwest Turkey today, to the coastal town of Troas. And he's in Troas and he has a dream. And, and you've heard of the dream that Paul has. There's a man on the beach, a Macedonian man. This is t- modern day Greece. And this man is saying, Come over and tell us about Jesus Christ. And so when Paul wakes up the next morning, he loads everyone on the boat, Silas, Luke. They get on the boat and they go across the Aegean Sea and land in Europe for the first time in in, in the city of Philippi. So we're going to pick up the story there. Grab your Bibles, Acts chapter 16, verse 12. And we read, we travel to Philippi, a Roman colony. And the leading city of that district of Macedonia, which is Greece. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and the members of her, of her household were baptized, she invited us into her home. And so look at this with me. Paul has this dream about a man from Macedonia inviting him to come there. But he gets there and he starts, it's a Sabbath, so he starts looking for men to hold synagogue with. Now, in Jewish tradition, in order to have synagogue, you have to have at least 10 men. And Paul can't find 10 men. He's looking all over Philippi, Philippi, it sounds like. And so he finally hears that down by the river, there's some women that are praying. And he goes down there and he finds this woman, Lydia. Now, here's the irony. Paul, in his Jewish Hebrew traditionalism, he goes there looking for a woman to, to start this new church. But he, God leads, I'm sorry, he goes there looking for a man, a man from Macedonia, and he, and he can't find them for synagogue. And God leads him to a woman. And this early church starts from a woman. When we lead through a woman, when we read Acts chapter 16, we are given a number of pieces of information about Lydia. All right, first we read that she's an entrepreneur. We read that, that she's a dealer in purple cloth, and everybody valued purple cloth then, and, and she's a successful entrepreneur, it sounds like. We read that she's a follower of God. We also now realize that she, as she accepts Jesus Christ and is baptized, she becomes the first European convert to Christianity. And then Paul, with her, she starts the first church in Europe in her house. She's the first church planter in Europe. This is all Lydia. Now, it's, it's highly unusual that Paul empowers a woman to do this. Because maybe you know this about first century Israel, but women were treated as second class citizens in Paul's day. A misogyny ran deep in Hebrew culture. But then Jesus comes along first, and then Paul, and they begin to lift up and empower women. I think one of the most significant aspects of Jesus' ministry that we often miss is that Jesus gave new value to women when people in his culture were holding women down. Uh, Jesus included women in his inner circle. Uh, Jesus had them sit at his feet and he discipled them and he taught them and, and, and they studied under him. Jesus gave them honor and respect and he listened to them. Jesus rescued women from their misogynistic, abusive cultural practices. Jesus, in large part, came to lift up women in a place where they're being pushed down. The problem is, the trouble is, 2,000 years later, 
women around the world globally are still pushed down. Women are still treated in many places as second-class citizens. They are silenced. They are treated as beasts of burden. And I think one of our godly responsibilities as people and as a church is to empower and to lift up women. That's our calling and that's our duty. Our grounding for insisting that women be given equal treatment and standing is the Imago Dei. I want, to, I want to invite you to move back all the way to the first pages of Scripture. And maybe you've heard me read this text before. But in Genesis chapter 1, we read this. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So both men and women, we read here, are made in the divine image of God. And this forever settles the question of the value and the meaningfulness and the honor that women are due. And the opportunity that women must be given to serve even in church just as, as, just, just as Lydia is. And sometimes we miss that. All right, so that's... That's Lydia. The next woman on our tour I want to introduce you to is Priscilla. Priscilla I'll describe as a powerful educator. Because after Paul's time in Philippi, he travels to Berea. Now, this is not Berea in Orange County. This is Berea in Greece somewhere. And then he travels to Athens. And then he settles in Corinth, which is a city on the Aegean Sea. And in Corinth, Paul meets this power couple by the name of Priscilla and Aquila. And in Acts chapter 18, we start to read about them. And so grab your Bibles and follow along. So Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. And there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. And Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. And every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So we read that he meets Priscilla and Aquila. And he realizes that they are the backbone, the powerhouse of the church in in Corinth. And then we read that, that Priscilla is an educator and she's teaching men. So move down to verse 24. A Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. And he was a learned man. With a thorough knowledge of Scripture, moved down. Though he, had only, though he knew only of the baptism of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him into their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So for, for 2,000 years, in my opinion, God has been using godly women like Priscilla, women, to teach and preach the good news of Jesus Christ. She brings in this fellow who's been preaching with her husband. They say, hang on, you have a few details wrong. And so she teaches him. And with her husband, they teach him. I think God used this, still has for 2,000 years, been using women as educators to shape and to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we miss that. My own mother was one of those women. When my father first started in the pastorate, she, she describes how she, there were attempts to hold her down and to silence her voice. For example, the first church my father took in the Deep South, um, they need, she wanted to start a choir. And so she called everyone together who wanted to be in the choir. And, and when they came in for the first practice, there was a gentleman there who said he was the former choir director before she got there. And when, when she started to take leadership, he stood up and he said, I'm sorry, you can't lead the choir. And uh, she says, why? And he said, because you're a woman. And he says, well, she said, well, I'm sorry. My, my husband, Jack, is a pastor, and he told me I could lead the choir. So that's what's happening. Uh, she's Scotch Irish. Don't get her wound up. And so he walked out of the room and left. Well, the, the organist now said a couple of complaints, but he sat at the organ, and, and they started the choir practice anyway. She says, but just a few minutes in, the organ broke down. And the organ player, he left in a huff. My mother says it was the hand of God because it sounded like a funeral in there. And so the organ player is gone, and she kept leading the choir. Uh, When my, my family moved to Africa, most of you know that my parents founded three Christian universities. 
in each of those universities, as my father built them, and he, he loves construction, and he's built hundreds of buildings in Africa. But when they started building each campus in Liberia, Uganda, Malawi, my father would lead the construction, uh, and later when it was built, he would teach. But my mother would spend those months getting the curriculum ready, writing the catalog, applying for accreditation to the government of Liberia, Malawi, Uganda. She met with the ministers of education in all of those countries. She met with the presidents and heads of states in order to get the colleges accredited. On all three of those university campuses, she raised the funds and started a radio station. And then she started a radio program called Bible College by Radio with my father. And every day, every week for the last 40 years, she's been broadcasting her radio program, teaching the Bible to every English-speaking country on the continent. That's my mother. Now, once in a while, when I was growing up, we'd have pastors come from America, male pastors come from America. And I've been at the dinner table when they've said things to my mother like, you know, Nell, you should not be teaching in the college because women should not be teaching men. And she would say, like I said, she's scotch Irish. She's like, they're lucky she stayed in her seat because she'd be all worked up. She'd say, the Bible doesn't say that. And Jack is the president, not you. <laughs> and she did. We can applaud that. Our world... Churches need strong women. And, and I just want to remind all of us of that, that some of the greatest Christian educators or educators, period, in our world today are women. And we can miss that. God uses women like Priscilla to teach and preach his good news. And women like my mother. All right, next I want to introduce you to Phoebe. Phoebe was a respected leader. Now, Phoebe is from Corinth. Uh, Paul makes a short, I'm sorry, from Corinth, Paul makes a short trip to another coastal town called Sincrea. And Phoebe lives in Sincrea. And, and when Paul goes there, though, he only goes there first, it sounds like, for a haircut. You think I'm making this up, but I just can only read you what's in the Bible. So turn over a page in your Bible, Acts 18, 18. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. And after that, he said goodbye to the brothers and sisters and went to nearby Sincrea. There he shaved his head. I told you, maybe there's a good barber there. He shaved his head according to the Jerusalem custom, uh, making the end to a vow. Now... It begs a question. Many of you know Paul Gunther and our staff. Last week he shaved his head, and so we're wondering what vow has he taken. Most have said maybe it's an answer to prayer because he had a mullet, now he doesn't, and so maybe his wife's prayer were answered well, along with the rest of ours. <laughs> we, we're losing our way here. This is important, though, because it's in, it's in Sincrea that Paul meets Phoebe. And Phoebe, we read, is also an affluent, influential, um, successful entrepreneur. And she's a philanthropist. She's extremely generous. And Paul, when he writes about Phoebe, he describes her like this. As a deacon, as a minister, he describes her as a great leader. Sometimes we miss those lines in the Bible. So when Paul is, is in Sincrea, he writes a letter to this church in Rome, and I call it his Empower Women letter, all right? And he writes this letter, and he asks Phoebe to carry it and take it to the church in Rome. So I need you to turn over in your Bibles to Romans chapter 16, and I want to read to you what he says here. I'm going to start in verse 1. This is from the Passion Translation. He says, now let me introduce you to our dear and beloved sister in the faith, Phoebe, a shining minister of the church in Sincrea. I'm sending her with this letter and ask that you shower her with hospitality. How do you like that? Uh, when she arrives, embrace her with honor. Underline that in your Bible. As it is fitting for one who belongs to the Lord and is set apart for him. So provide her with whatever she may need. For she has been a great leader, circle that, and champion of many. I know, for she's been that, even for me. So Paul sends her with this letter. And Phoebe becomes a global ambassador for Jesus Christ. And what does Paul say to the church in Rome? He says, treat her with honor. Embrace her. Give her the dignity and the respect that she needs, that she deserves. The problem is, 2,000 years later, 2,000 years after Paul writes this, 
women today around the world still are not given the dignity, the dignity and the respect that they deserve. Women are still held down, pushed down, and, and marginalized. Misogyny is still a problem around the, the globe. Women still do not have equal rights, equal access to education. They do not have equal opportunity. In most places around the world, women are at a disadvantage simply because they are women. And I share that only to say that we have to change that. As people of God, we are called to put an end to that and to lift up women. As I talk about women being marginalized around the world, I'll give you a few examples. I used to live in Malawi, East Africa. In Malawi, on average, girls and women spend nine hours a day collecting water. Nine hours. On average, boys and men spend one hour. What does that do? It gives women and girls less access to education. It doesn't allow them to enter the workforce like men. It, it holds them down. It keeps them from thriving. In Cambodia, 14% of rural men are illiterate. Just 14%. 86% are literate. Among rural women, 48% are illiterate. Every day, 33,000 girls around the world are made into child brides before they are ready. And they have little future after that. Around the world, globally, 20, uh, women earn 24% less than men. And I share all of that only to say that we need to change this. I think in the same way that when we look back at past centuries, at the problems of colonialism or slavery, we look at those past centuries and the people who lived at those times, we go, why didn't they say more? That's a blight on, on humanity and history. Why didn't they do more? And today, the blight on our century, the 21st century, the shame to all of us is that women do not have equal treatment around the world. And it's time to change that. I think God put his people like you and me and churches like the Grove to here to change that. When we hear that women around the world are not given equal access in most, of most areas of life, we think, well, I'm sure glad that's not the case in this country. But I hate to say it, the truth is, no, women in many ways are not given equal opportunity even in our country. And unfortunately, it's especially among some churches and some churches and some denominations. I grew up in churches where women were not given equal opportunity. As a young pastor, I thought it was just a sad inevitable that women could not have equal access to leadership or the pastorate that men did. And then about 10 or 12 years ago, it hit me, Palmer, you need to, you need to get to the bottom of this yourself because you're just taking what other people have said. And so I started to dig into Scripture. And I read every passage that I had heard pastors or theologians used to hold down women. I also read every good book that I could get my hands on on this issue. My favorite author on this is a New Testament theologian from from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. It's where I had received my PhD. He was a professor there at the time. Many consider him uh, the leading New Testament theologian in our country. His name is N.T. Wright, Dr. N.T. Wright. And he has a book, um, Blue Parakeet, and he has another book, Junia Was a Woman. And those books had, made, had a powerful impact on my life. But as I dug into the scripture that was used to hold down women and what theologians, some theologians and pastors I said, I realized that their theological arguments were incredibly weak and that they, at the end of the day, are flat wrong. Their hermeneutics are shoddy. I've got to be honest. I'm really worked up about this, and I have been for years. And I want to say this with conviction. The Bible does not prohibit women from leading or serving as pastors. And that's why at the Grove, we license women as pastors. That's why we have godly women like Crystal Richardson, who was here on our elder board. She was here earlier praying and reading a liturgy. Some years ago, after I, I felt conviction about this, I made three podcasts, video podcasts, and I put them up on my YouTube channel. And 
they're not three, I made four. They're four uh, podcasts on empowering women. And by the way, if you want to watch them, they're still there. Hit subscribe while you're there. All right, there you go. And so uh, I had posted these, three, these four videos, uh, podcast on empowering women. And that week, my family was out at a restaurant. And uh, when we were leaving, uh, uh, there was a couple that we ran into that we knew well. Great godly couple. They, they attend, a, attend a different church. And uh, as I'm leaving, she said, can I, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And so she got up and she said, Palmer, I want you to know your, your podcast had a huge impact on me. She said, thank you for saying what you've said. And then she said this. She said, I wish I'd heard that a long time ago. And I said, why? She said, well, she said, I always wanted to go into church ministry. I always wanted to be a pastor, a minister. And I was told I couldn't. And I said, well, it's, you still can. You still can. And she says, it's too late. And, and, and I said, it's not too late. She, she hadn't hit, even hit 40. I don't think she was 40. I said, and I tried to say it's not. And she just started to weep and cry. Because the weight of being pushed down was so heavy for so many years. She was giving up. And I want to say to every woman here this morning, don't give up. We're here to lift you up and to empower you. It's why we started Justice College, to empower and lift up women and give women a voice. And so I say that for, for all of all, every woman here today. Follow the example of women like Phoebe. All right, here's the last woman I want to introduce you to. Her name is Junia. Junia, we read, was a fearless apostle. So like I said, Paul had written this empower women's letter to the church in Rome. And in Paul's letter, he describes the women as deacons, co-workers, and apostle. I want you to listen here as I read to his string of ringing endorsements for the women leaders in the church in Rome and other places. This is Romans 16. I'm going to start reading in verse 1, we read this. Now, uh, I'm going to read through verse 7. I commend you, and I'm gonna, it starts with Phoebe. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sincrea. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers. So he refers to Priscilla as his co-worker in, in Jesus Christ. They risk their lives for me. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Adronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. That's why I say Junia is a fearless leader. Uh, they are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Uh, underline that in your Bibles, they are, uh, that they, both not just Adronicus, but Junia as well, is outstanding among the apostles. Junia is not just fearless, but Paul acknowledges that she is an apostle. Some over the years have tried to deny that, but the scriptures are clear. It's written in black and white. God, my point here is that God uses strong, fearless women like Junia to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. God uses strong, godly women like Mother George in Liberia to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. A strong woman who would not take no for an answer. A woman who almost died from malaria a number of times. God uses strong, fearless women, women like Junia and Mother George. And like Christine Sani. I hope you were here last week. If you weren't here last week, you have to watch our, have to watch our live stream from last week. But last Sunday, Christine Sani, who leads our children's ministry, she, she preached here on the stage. It was her Sunday. And she shared her life story. And part of her life story was traveling through East Africa on a bus for eight days, day and night. As she tells her story, I'm just shaking my head going, oh, my goodness. I don't know how she left there alive. And if, I, and if she was my daughter, I, would have, I don't know if I would have lied that. But I'm sure glad she's on our staff because this church needs strong women leaders like Christine Sani. I just want to end today by encouraging you, by encouraging all of us, by saying that globally, I believe a new day is dawning for women. I see the veil is lifting. I, I see that the centuries of marginalizing women and holding them down and treating them as second-class citizens, I see that it is ending. But rather than following, I want to challenge us as God's people to lead the way both individually and as a church, corporately. 
because God has put us here to treat every person, to lift up especially his daughters, his women, uh, and, and give them the dignity and honor that they deserve. On this Mother's Day, I want to remind you of that. I want to close by praying a blessing over our mothers and women today. Would you join me? Would you stand and bow your heads as I pray this prayer from Scripture? Mothers and women today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. And may the Lord give you strength. Know today, mothers and women, that you are loved deeply by God. You're his daughter. Be strong in knowing this, that you are the daughter of the King of Kings. And he is always standing with you, beside you, watching over you, and empowering you. In Jesus' name.